Okay, we're live. Okay. Should I welcome people? I guess I should. Hello, whoever's here. <laughs> we're going to start in a few minutes. Um, welcome everybody, anybody who's here. Um, this is going to be a reading from When Things Get Dark, Stories Inspired by Shirley Jackson, which is an anthology coming out next week, the 28th. <clears throat> this was originally not even coordinated with the publication, but then I found out the publication was supposed to be the 21st. So I was like, great, we have a launch party. And then I was told, oh no, things got screwed up. It's not coming out for a week. So it's not exactly a launch party. But we're launching it anyway. So who cares? <clears throat> but anyway, welcome. Hi, Jonathan. Um, so we have eight of the contributors here and we're using a system called StreamYard that we use for KGB, which is why you can see fantastic fiction at KGB in the corner. Can every, everyone see that, Matt? Yes. Yeah. Okay, and we're all against the KGB backdrop, too. So I think maybe uh, we'll, we should wait a few minutes. Why don't we wait? We'll start around five after, okay, everybody? <laughs> so each reader is gonna read about 10 minutes, eight to 10 minutes. After about four readers, we'll probably take a short break um, of five minutes or so, so people can get a drink or whatever. <clears throat> and then we'll, the other readers will read. <clears throat> and then we'll have a Q&A, an open Q&A, if people have questions for any of us or all of us. Hi, Amy. Do you have a chat window we don't have? Because I don't see these people coming in. It's in the it's comments. Comment, comment. On the upper right-hand side. Right. Do you see oh, it? Oh, there it is. Hello. Yeah. Yes, right. It's comments, and the left part is our private chat. If you have a question, you know. Hi, Tracy. Hi, whoever Nixel mixes. <laughs> ah, cool. Yes. Mix, mix. Yes, I gather um, the book is out already on audio, which I hadn't realized. Oh, cool. Yeah. Who read it, uh, uh, Ellen? Who did the, it the audible? Yeah, the audio, the e -book. I don't audio know. Book. I think several people. I'm not really sure. I remember when they were asking a few questions. Um, Snixel, have you read any of it? Have you heard? Or have you listened to any of it yet? If you have, how are the how are the readings? It takes. There's always a lag from the comment. I don't know who Snixel Snixel is. <laughs> It's a great name, man. It's Nick's or Nick's Nick's. Oh, many readers in, many readers. Okay. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Cool. Okay, you're done. Mm. Oh, there's another contest or cattail. We'll see if any of mine show up. Oh, Jack's right here. You can see Jack. That's Jack the drunk uh, on the couch. No. I swear. Tinker Bell or Verity? I think he's getting bigger every day. I mean, every day I look at him and I say, He's gigantic. That was Tinkerbell. Um, the cats are a little ticked off because right about now is usually when treats time happens. Uh, and yeah. treats time is a ritual that, of course, is not going on because mommy is busy. Yes, well, I fed mine early. So they're going to be hungry in like in an hour. They're both going to be bugging me for more food, thinking they hadn't eaten. I don't know what's so Oh, wow. Tinkerbell just punched Elsie in the face. It's going to be a fun oh, evening. Right here. Oh, jeez. Hi, Daniel. So for those who just came in, welcome. We'll be starting in about a few minutes, like five after. Good to see everybody. I'm hoping my mom's going to show up. Mm. <laughs> yeah, this is Verity. Oh, yeah, it's Verity. Oh, beautiful. So fluffy and very unhappy. Yep, because I picked her up from the tree that I dumped on the floor to make up for not getting the proper ritual. <laughs> Makes sense. Everyone is angry tonight. Oh, no. Perfect. But it's lovely to see everybody. Yes. It is. Yep. I, uh, oh, I have Steven, no idea. I like your library behind you. Your bookshelves are nice, Stephen. Yeah, they from a distance, they look all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a COVID training earlier and somebody was like, oh, who are those people behind you? And I'm like, my family. 
It's like, no, they're well, just ran, random fucking people I have on my Well, to be honest, I do have some random fucking people. I mean, I have some antique pictures and family. No, totally. It's yeah. you know. <laughs> Ah, hi. Cassandra, are you actually going to keep a cat from being on the screen during what is effectively a giant Zoom call? I, I don't think that is. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know, you know what, you know what, you're right. Okay, fine. Yeah. Here. Amy, you said Amy Goldschlager says that Blackstone Publishing did the audio. Then how come it's on Audible? I don't understand the system. Then. Yeah, I mean, Audible carries the Tor.com audiobooks, even though those are recorded in house. I think they just pay differently. Oh, really. Because Amy just said Blackstone did the audio. Cool. Well, I don't know. You know, I never listen to the audio. I just don't bother. Oh, I, oh, I see. They're distributed by Audible. Okay, got it. Hello from there. Hi, Nashville. I know. I know you. Oh, and there's Karen. Hi, yeah. Greg is from Nashville. Hey, Karen. <clears throat> I hear crashes. What are those? That would be my cat's being terrible. No, you are not oh. eating <laughs> headache pills. No, I am oh. not for cats. Yeah, part of why I'm out here rather than in the dining room is that last night Thomas tried to help me sort my adventures in the Forgotten Realms magic cards. Oh, and the no. difference, yeah, the difference between clutter and an actual mess is how many cards are on the floor. Right. And he took us from category one to category two in about five seconds flat, and then I had to resort all the greens. Great. Oh, no. What are you doing, dude? Okay, one more minute, and we'll start. Cool. Do, 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 do. Okay. I'm trying to give your sister a treat. Hi, Carol. Oh, I just echoed. Can you hear the yeah. echo? Uh oh. Is there anything I can do about that? Someone might have their volume a little high, but uh, when when everyone's reading, I'll, I'll I'll solo them so everyone else will be muted. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter. I won't be reading anyway. Unless we have extra time and really want to kill it, I can I can read the intro, but I don't want to. <laughs> okay, it's time. Welcome to this special reading uh, from when things get dark. And uh, <clears throat> we have eight people who contributed to the book. And each one will read about 10 minutes. In between, around um, after four people read, we'll probably take a short break. And I want to thank Matt Kressel, who's my partner in crime for KGB. And he's helping. He's doing the tech on this because I have no clue. So he's in control of all our tech. And um, I'm going to start. Uh, Introducing the first person to read, and of course I didn't, I didn't uh, get the bio out. <laughs> Here you are. <clears throat> Shauna McGuire is going to read first. Shauna McGuire lives above a swamp in the Pacific Northwest, where the sunlight is very different and often filtered through blackberry briars. She shares her home with four large cats, at least one of whom we've seen, <laughs> an axolotl, and a remarkably large assortment of books, dolls, and My Little Ponies. Seanan is the author of several dozen books across a variety of genres under both her own name and the name Mary Grant. She spends most of her time writing, which makes perfect sense given the rest of the situation. Find her on Twitter at, at Seanan McGuire or at www.seananmcguire.com. Please welcome Sean and McGuire. Oh, and by the way, each person, just say the name of your story, Sedona. I don't have to remember it. <laughs> so I've just hit somatic satiation with my own name um, and also StreamYard reverses our image, so I'm trying to fix my fluffy hair. Uh, but I am Sean and McGuire, and I'm going to be reading tonight from In the Deep Woods, The Light is Different There. A child will tell you, if asked, and in the mindset to answer questions as they are posed and not as the child's mind would have them interpreted, for the ears of children seem to work differently than the ears of adults, to be tuned to a different set of sighs and susurrations, not to the clean consonants and simple constructions of the adult vocabulary. And the answers of children are often similarly distorted by the journey they must take in being spoken, that the sunlight is the same everywhere it falls. There is only one sun, as so many songs have eagerly told them since the day of their birth, there is only one sun and its light falls everywhere at the same speed, landing on the just and the unjust alike. 
Thus it stands to reason that the sun which falls on a quiet suburban street or a lakeside cabin must by its very nature be the same as the sun which falls on the trees of the deep entangled wood beyond the lake. Those children will already know, of course, that they are wrong, for if they are old enough to venture outside without supervision, even if they have never been further from their beds than the safe enclosures of their backyards, that they are lying, which is a practice that even the most profoundly honest of children must frequently engage in, for adults have little interest in hearing truth from children when lies are so much sweeter. The worlds of children are low to the ground, terrifying and confusing, filled with dangers adult minds have forgotten, truths adult hurts have forsaken. So at times, when their worlds collide with others, they must be untrue to be believed. The truth is a rock too big to swallow, especially in adulthood, when years of caustic words and swallowing back inappropriate retorts has left their throats scarred and narrow. The sunlight is not the same everywhere it falls, as anyone who has been to a desert or a wide urban parking lot, and also to the peak of a mountain or the crest of a hill, can tell you. The sun may be the same, but once the light has left the sun, it is transformed by travel and by time into something new, something as sweet and profound as a secret, sometimes kind and sometimes cruel, but always sunlight all the same. Desert sun is unforgiving. Not bad, not malicious, but unforgiving, ready to punish any small mistake. Coastal sun is diffuse and muddled, unable to warm the frozen, unable to save the lost. And in the very deepest woods, where the trees stand sentinel over ground that has never been free of roots and rot, where the branches block the sky and the birds rule the universe, the sunlight falls like treacle or like honey from a hive. It is not sweet, but is slow, ponderous, and intentional. It cannot be called welcoming, cannot be called warm. When it strikes a human face, it offers no succor, extends no hand of welcome. The sun which falls in the deep of the woods does not want us there. It knows who it serves, and that master is not the quick, swift humanity of city and shore, is not the place where civilization meets curiosity, and drives the domesticated descendants of our feral ancestors to seek the woods and waters wild. It does not want us there. There are places, liminal places, where the walls grow thin, where the deep heart of the woods can abut upon that which has been tamed and tampered down, claimed and collected. Places neither civilized nor free, where the sun can shift in an instant to correspond with the passing of a cloud or the lighting of a match. In these places grow the strange ones, humans who can breathe in both the sweet treacle sunlight of the modern world and the deep, rich, cruel sunlight of the ancient one. They are children of a stranger sun, but they are human still and their desires matter no less than the desires of their citified cousins. Their needs are no less import, important or essential. It is only when those needs collide with the needs of the softer world that trouble can be found. They walk the deep woods, the places where the light hangs heavy in the trees and the dark hangs heavier still, and what they want and what they dream is the business of the deep woods and the deep woods alone, and the question they are never asked and would never answer if they were is a simple one. If the sunlight is so transformed by its fall into the deep woods, what do they do to the moonlight? What does the night become? What transformations can such light wreak in its own time, in its own right? They smile and they know that they're perfect and they walk in shadows made of light and they are perfect and they are profane and they would not forgive us if they could. The lake house hadn't been used in some time. That much was clear as soon as the door was opened, sending a puff of stale air and dust billowing onto the porch. Millie recoiled, unable to quite believe that the place had been allowed to regress into such a state of disrepair. What was the point of the caretakers her grandfather had arranged, the ones whose fee was dutifully deducted from her trust fund three times a year, when the seasons changed and they were meant to air the place out, keeping it ready for human habitation? She fought back the desire to pull out the letter she had already read easily a dozen times, the one that promised this place would be prepared for her arrival. Well, if this was prepared, she wasn't sure she could understand what it had driven her grandfather to spend every summer by this lake, grandparents to spend every summer by this lake, right up until the year they disappeared. Her father always spoke of the lake house as a bucolic paradise, a necessary respite from the speed and stress of city life. Without it, he'd told her once, he would have gone quite mad in the aftermath of his divorce from her mother when she had seemed to permeate every square inch of the city, turning a wide, clean world into a small and filthy enclosure. Only, as, but only by getting as far from her concrete cage as he possibly could had he been free of her. Millie hadn't been able to follow. 
She'd been too young, and the custody agreement between her parents forbade either one of them to take her out of the state without written permission. She'd hated it as a child, hated being left behind, hated knowing that her mother was forbidding her the lake house out of spite, and that in so doing had driven her father to forbid her summers at Walt Disney World, winters in Paris, all numbers of other little luxuries that she, as the child of two well-off New Yorkers, had every reason to feel were her due. Somehow he had always managed to make the lake house seem equal to these grand adventures, to make the punishment fit the crime, even though the crime had never been hers, and the punishment always, inevitably had. And now here she is, finally, and her father is gone to the worms and the rot, and her mother is gone to the fire and the wind, one buried, the other cremated, and she stands alone. Her own divorce has been finalized, her name sundered from Marcus's forever. She has no family left in the world, and nothing but their combined bank accounts to comfort her through the long, lonely nights. Those, and the lake house, which is finally hers to have for her own, as long as she doesn't mind sharing it with the moths and spiders, it seems. The gust of foul air has subsided, picking up her suitcase one-handed, aware that she's trapped here for all intents and purposes. The phone line was disconnected years ago, and while she's working to have it reestablished, things in the country happen at a fraction of the speed the city considers slow. She'll be lucky if she has a dial tone by August. All apart from that, the driver who brought her here has returned home by now, leaving her alone in what, is might, in what it might as well be another century, to say nothing of another country. No, her mother made the city a cage to keep her, and she has willingly traded it for a cage of her father's design, which may be of a different shape and size, but which has just as many bars on the windows and just as many walls. But it doesn't contain any angry ex-husbands who like to settle their arguments with their fists, and it doesn't contain any easy means of tracking her down. And with those thoughts reigning over all others, she squares her shoulders and steps through the open door into a room full of ghosts. For a moment, in the hazy sunlight that filters through the windows, filled with dancing motes of dust that seem almost too large to be real, she is absolutely standing in a haunted house. A scream bubbles up in her throat, momentarily trapped behind the cemetery gates of her lips, and she knows that when it breaks loose, it will be large enough to shake down the walls. The specks of light catch and hold her gaze, yanking it from the specters surrounding her. She used to see fairies like this in her childhood, in the days when she bedeviled nannies and lived in what her mother termed a form-fitting fairyland, a place filled only with peace and magic and no divorce, no warring parents, no miseries at all. Then she blinks and the fairies are dust motes again and the dust motes are fading into the background and the ghosts are furnishings covered in dusty white sheets as old and unused as the rest of this place. The money she's been paying for upkeep has been going to line the pockets of her so-called caretakers if it's been doing anything at all, obviously enough, because they haven't raised so much as a finger to prepare for her arrival. She told them she was coming. She knows she did. She sent three letters and called twice and she distinctly remembers receiving at least one reply. Or she thinks she did. It could be hard to tell on the long and empty afternoons in her apartment in the city what was fact and what was supposition. She supposes the afternoons will be just as long here, and just as lonely, with her driver already gone back to the city. These walls will be her new cage, one she finds far more pleasant than the dangers she's left behind. Her mother warned her, before she died, that Marcus seemed like the sort of man who might turn cruel if she stopped giving him what he wanted, but since what he wanted was a young, beautiful, independently wealthy wife with which to dazzle his competitors, she had talked her mother's up warnings up to the ramblings of a bitter old woman whose own marriage had collapsed and left her with nothing better to do than to torture her only child, since all her friends were dead and unavailable to be lectured. She hadn't known then, couldn't have known, that one day Marcus's demands would shift to sons and heirs, children born of his seed and her body's labors to carry on his family name, made great and glorious by her coffers and his business acumen. And she couldn't have known that her body would be opposed to this idea, would refuse to give him any heirs at all, but least of all the son he so eagerly demanded. She couldn't have known that after five years of failures, he would turn to making his wishes known with his fists and with the backs of his hands, and on one dark occasion with his boots, leading to kidney damage, a weekend in the hospital, and finally, at long last, the divorce papers her lawyers had been urging her to file for over a year. Thankfully, their prenuptial agreement had been drawn up by, by, by lawyers far more expensive than he could afford on his own, and she'd been able to walk away with most of her fortune intact, shielded from his grasping hands by restraining orders and legal paperwork. She'd escaped with her money and her reputation, and all it had cost was the city she loved so much. So that takes us to the end of my time. Thank you very much.
Yay. Thank hey. you. Lovely. Thank you. And welcome to Karen and David and anyone else who showed up since. Um, Anticathonica's axolotls. Yes. And I want to know, what is that thing behind you, Seanan? Behind uh, that? Yeah. This is what happens when your mother decides that she should hang an inflatable pterodactyl from the Museum of Natural History in the catio area. Okay, but it's got some <laughs> Okay. So, well, yes, because Thomas is now the only Maine Coon who can genuinely say that he has slaughtered a prehistoric flying <laughs> reptile. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Our next reader is going to be Laird Barron. Laird Barron spent his early years in Alaska. He is the author of several books, including the beautiful thing that awaits us all, Swift to Chase, and Worse Angels. His work has also appeared in many magazines and anthologies. Barron currently resides in the Rondout Valley, writing stories about the evil that he can do, including the one from which he's reading, from which he's reading. <laughs> so please welcome Laird Barron. Hey everybody, um, before I get started, uh, thank you Ellen and Matt. Uh, for having us on tonight. And thanks to everybody out there watching. The uh, story I'm going to read is uh, read from just the first five or six pages. It's called Tiptoe. I was a child of the 60s. Three network stations or fresh air. Take your pick. No pocket computers for ent entertainment in dark age suburbia. We read our comic books ragged and played catch with dad in the backyard. He created shadow puppets on the wall to amuse us before bed. Elephants, giraffes, and boxes, the classics. He also made some animals I didn't recognize. His hands twisted to form these mysterious entities, which he called memes. Dad frequently traveled abroad, said he'd learned the memes at a conference in Australia. His double jointed performances wowed me and my older brother, Greg. Mom hadn't seemed quite as impressed. Then I discovered photography. Mom and dad gave me a camera, partly because they were supportive of their children's aspirations, partly because I bugged them relentlessly. At six years old, I already understood my life's purpose. Landscapes bore me, although I enjoy celestial photography. High resolution photos of planets hanging in partial silhouette blazing white fingertips emerging from a black pool. People <clears throat> aren't as interesting unless I catch them in candid moments to reveal a glimmer of their hidden selves. No, wild animals became my favorite subjects. Of all the variety of animals, I love predators. Dad approved. He once said, men revile predators because they shed blood. What an unfair prejudice. Suppose garden vegetables possessed feelings. Suppose a carrot squealed when bitten in two. Well, the groundhog would go right on chomping, wouldn't he? If anybody knew the answer to such a question, it'd be my old man. His oddball personality might be why mom took a shine to him. Or perhaps she appreciated his potential as a captain of industry. What I do know is he was the kind of guy nobody ever saw coming. My name is Randall Xerxes Vance. Friends tease me about my signature, RX, and a swooping offset V. Dad used to say, son, you're a prescription for trouble. As a pro wilderness photographer, I'm accustomed to lying or sitting motionless for hours at a stretch. Despite this, I'm a tad jumpy. You could say my fight or flight reflex is highly tuned. While on assignment for a popular magazine, a technician, infamous for his pranks, snuck up, tapped my shoulder, and yelled, boo. I swung instinctively, wild, flailing, but good enough to knock him on his ass into a ditch. Colleagues were nonplussed at my overreaction. Me too. That incident proved the beginning of a rough emotional ride. Insomnia nightmares when I could sleep, and panic attacks. It felt like a crack had opened in my psyche. 
generalized anxiety gradually worked its claws under my armor and skinned me to raw nerves. I committed to a leave of absence, pledging to conduct an inventory of possible antecedents. Soul searching pairs seductively with large quantities of liquor. A soon to be ex-girlfriend offered to help. She opined that I suffered from deep rooted childhood trauma. I insisted that my childhood was actually fine. My parents had provided for me and my brother, supported our endeavors, and paid for our education, the whole deal. There's always something if you dig, she said. Subsequent to a bunch more poking and prodding, one possible link between my youth and current problems came to mind. I told her about a game called Tiptoe, Dad taught me. A variation of ambush tag, wherein you crept behind your victim and tapped him or her on the shoulder or goose them or whatever. Pretty much the same as my work colleague had done. Belying its simple premise, there were rules, which dad adhered to with solemnity. The victim must be awake and unimpaired. The sneaker was required to assume a certain posture. Poised on the balls of his or her feet, arms raised, and fingers pressed into a blade or spread in an exaggerated manner. The other details and prescriptions are hazy. As far as odd family traditions go, this seemed fairly innocuous. Dad's attitude was what made it weird. Tiptoe went back as far as I could recall, but my formal introduction occurred at age six. Greg and I were watching a nature documentary. Dad wandered in late still dressed from a shift at the office and wearing that coldly affable expression he put on along with his hat and coat. The documentary shifted to the hunting habits of predatory insects. Dad sat between us on the couch. He stared intently at the images of mantises, voracious Venezuelan centipedes and wasps. During the segment on trapdoor spiders, he smiled and pinched my shoulder. Dad was fast for an awkward middle-aged dude. I didn't even see his arm move. People say sneaky as a snake, sly as a fox, but spiders are the best hunters, patient and swift. I didn't really give it a second thought. One day soon after, he stepped out of a doorway, grabbed me, and started tickling. Then he snatched me into the air and turned my small body in his very, very large hands. He pretended to bite my neck, my arms, and belly. Which part shall I devour first? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo! I screamed hysterical laughter. He explained that tickling and the reaction to tickling were rooted in primitive flight or, excuse me, primitive fight or flight responses to mortal danger. Tiptoe became our frequent contest and one he'd already inflicted on Greg and mom. The results seldom amounted to more than the requisite tap, except for the time when dad popped up from a leaf pile and pinched me so hard it left a welt. You bet I tried to return the favor, on countless occasions, in fact, and failed. I even wore camo paint and dressed in black down to my socks, creeping closer, ever closer, only for him to whip his head around at the last second and looked me in the eye with a tinge of disappointment. Heard you coming from the other end of the house, son. Are you thinking like a man or a spider? Like a fox or a mantis? Keep trying. Another time I walked into a room and caught him playing the game with mom as victim. He gave me a sidelong wink as he reached out, tiptoeing closer, closer. Their silhouettes flickered on the wall. The shadows of his arms kept elongating. His shadow fingers ended in shadow claws. The optical illusion made me dizzy and sick to my stomach. He kissed her neck. She startled and mildly cussed him. And then they laughed and once more he was ham, a ham-fisted doofus, innocently pushing his glasses up the bridge of his nose. As with many aspects of childhood, tiptoe fell to the wayside for reasons that escaped me until the job incident brought it crashing home again. Unburdening to my lady friend didn't help either of us much as we'd hoped. 
she acknowledged that the whole backstory was definitely fucked up and soon found other places to be. Probably had a lot to do with my drinking, increasingly moody behavior, and the fact that I nearly flew out of my skin whenever she walked into the room. And there's a little bit, I'm just going to jump forward for the last paragraph. There's a little bit where he goes to visit his mom and kind of digs into the background uh, of this game and his childhood. In the wee hours alone in my studio apartment, I woke from a lucid nightmare. Blurry, forgotten childhood images coalesced with horrible clarity. Aunt Vicky suffering what we politely termed an episode. The still image of a missing woman on the six o'clock news. My father polishing his glasses and smiling cryptically. Behind him, a sun-dappled lake, a stand of thick trees, and a lost trail that wound into the Catskills, or purgatory. There were other more disturbing recollections that clamored for attention. Whirling in a black mass on the periphery, I poured a glass of whiskey and dug into a shoebox of loose photos, mainly snapshots documenting, documenting our happiest moments as a family. I searched those smiling faces for signs of trauma, a hint of anguish to corroborate my tainted memories. Trouble is, old weathered pictures are ambiguous. You can't always tell what's hiding behind the patina. Nothing or the worst thing imaginable. And that's where I'll leave you. Thank you very much. Hey. That was awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was. And next we have Gemma Files. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Gemma Files was born in England. I always forget that, that you were born in England. And raised in Toronto, Canada. And has been a journalist, teacher, film critic, and an award-winning horror author for almost 30 years. She's published four novels, a story cycle, three collections of short fiction, and three collections of speculative poetry. Her most recent novel, most experimental film, see, I think that's all up Already, it's outdated. <laughs> you know, won both the 2015 Shirley Jackson Award for Best Novel and the 2016 Sunburst Award for Best Novel Adult Category. She is currently working on her next book, which is actually finished and out, I think. <laughs> coming up this year. Please welcome Gemma Files. Um, I, I will point out that that was my most recent novel and is still my most recent novel, but. Uh, I do have a collection that's out right now called In This Endlessness, Our End. Um, okay, so a little bit of setup. Uh, the story is called Pair of Anguish. Um, two, two girls, Una and Imogen, um, meet when Una uh, transfers to Imogen's school. They are both weird and uh, are starting to enjoy being weird together as much as they can enjoy anything, so. You've been hanging around with Imogen, Jenny Diamond said, as I put my glasses back on after drying my hair, still huge and naked from my post-swimming lesson shower. I surfaced, blinking, taken aback to see her there and horrified to see she had the whole fucking pack with her. All the populars at once, Fazia Moorcroft, Nene Jones, Perry Boyle, I mean, we, wa we wanted to make sure you knew about her before you made a mistake. It's not too late, Jenny said. I already knew I was blushing again, probably all over, cl clutching my wet towel like a shield and wanting to hit her so hard she'd cough up blood. So hard I had to breathe a moment deep before I spoke. Too late for what? I asked her finally. Nene and Faz grinned at each other. You know she's a witch, right? Faz asked. Witches aren't real, I said. That's what a witch would say, Nene told me. You a witch too, Ina? No, I snapped back, already knowing it was the wrong answer. Later, after they'd gone, after I'd screamed at them until they left me alone at last, hard enough to hurt myself, hard enough that swallowing felt like something scraping the inside of my throat, I retreated to the toilet and crouched there, crying. Slow, hot tears rereading the back of the cubicle's door top to bottom like a litany le freak say chic heather sucks dick frig yourself imogen equals witchy poo pretty soon my name would be up there too probably misspelled so i bit into my thumb till i could taste salt until the tooth marks were deep enough to sink an entire nail into 
until I knew I'd still have bruises two weeks on, purple, gray, and yellow, like swearing blood brothers, I guess, but without the other person. When Imogen saw what I'd done, saw the marks I'd made on myself, her otherwise unreadable eyes got all wide and soft, as if I'd handed her a ring or something, and I knew it, was all she said quietly. I knew you were like me. Nothing to say to that, but yes, obviously. So I nodded instead, knowing that from now on, we'd be the same in everybody's eyes, kicking myself for thinking I could ever avoid it. Come out, Imogen told me that first day as I crouched in the bushes watching her. You're Una, right? Think I can't see you? I can see everything. That seemed unlikely, but I instantly felt dumb for being there. So I stood up instead, crossed my arms and scowled at her. Fuck you face screwed on hard, expecting her to be frightened, which she very much obviously wasn't. Beckoned me over peremptorily and showed me what she was doing, how she'd set creek washed rocks in a circle with a baby doll's detached plastic face in the middle, looking up, blue eyes blind in the green dark, diffuse sunlight slipping down around ravine bridge. The fuck is that for, I asked, and she giggled. You swear like a boy, she said. Is that because you're so tall? I don't know, I fucking like it. So what is that anyway? I'm making a scrying mirror, watch. She turned it over then, showing me a small round mirror she carefully fitted inside the face, probably from somebody's makeup kit. First, you have to cure it, see? Take a flame and melt the edges so it won't fall out, the sign of fire. Then leave it all night where the wind can get at it, especially if it's blowing past a graveyard, the sign of night, the sign of air. Then wash it in the creek and leave it down here under a bunch of leaves, looking down into the dirt, the sign of earth and water. One thing left to do now, anoint it and see if it works. Anoint it with what? Another giggle. What do you think? She asked, pointing to where my sleeves had rucked up, glued with sweat, to show off those scars inside both my wrists. Those scratches I always told people came from the cat, if they asked, which they mostly didn't. Not to mention the deeper cuts, treated with Bactine and Band-Aids, which I never told anybody about at all. I had a hook. I'd stolen from my Nana's embroidery kit once, meant for ripping seams. Imogen had a pen knife, the kind that folds out, its handle wrapped in tape she'd colored black. She stuck its point into the pad at the base of her pointer finger, between heart and head lines and twisted till she had to pull it out sideways, freeing a drop of blood the size of a dime. Now you, she commanded, and I didn't even think to disobey. I was far too interested at that point. I wanted to see if it would work. Nothing I'd ever tried by myself had up to that point, and I'd always wondered why. All little girls try practicing magic eventually, my first girlfriend would tell me in our second year of university. That's because magic offers power, and they don't have any. Magic tells you that things can change if you want it bad enough. They haven't figured out yet how that's a fucking fairy tale, and fairy tales aren't real. And I remember nodding, but that was mainly because I was drunk and she was beautiful, enough so I wanted to agree with her thinking as I did how I could sure tell her some stuff to the contrary if I wanted, if I felt like I had the right to. I used to have a friend who disagree was all I ended up telling her, though. So low, I don't think she actually heard me. Imogen squeezed her wound until she'd painted a triangle on the mirror's surface point up. Now you, she said, but Wittershins, opposite, other way round, point down. I know what Wittershins is, I told her grumpily sticking the hook between my index and middle fingers, to which she laughed again, full on this time, loud enough to startle a nearby pigeon. Of course you do, she said. And what did you see in the scrying mirror, Una? A voice asks from deep inside my mind, that first psychiatrist mom sent me to, maybe, with her sad, smart eyes, to which I answer internally, nothing. I saw nothing. I never saw anything at all. Not even when I said I did. And what did Imogen see, do you think? I can't know that. I only know what she said she saw over and over, a way out, an escape, a door to somewhere better than this shitty world we both knew we were trapped in, the place where one step forwards always led two steps back, where everyone else got away with everything and we got away with nothing, not even with being two similarly inclined weirdos, lucky enough to find each other, to share an affinity, to make up stories together and lie our way into believing them, acting like we believed them anyhow, on my part. 
And yes, we hurt ourselves. We hurt each other. Why not? Pain was already a constant. Imogen's fairy tales at least promised that pain could be harnessed, used as currency. They promised it could be bartered for entry into the numinous. No different from any other religion that way, any other mythology. All the ones we'd studied and discarded on our own before finding each other. I mean, pain really should count for something, don't you think? Considering how much it hurts. Think about it, Imogen told me. Why do other people hurt us? To get what they want, which is for us to hurt. Cause and effect. So when we hurt ourselves, Una, what do we want out of it? What can we possibly want? To not hurt anymore? She didn't answer, simply waited, which is how I knew. She must be disappointed in my reasoning. Okay, no, no, obviously that's too easy. To hurt, as long as it hurts them too, like they hurt us. And, she prompted, get away with it. That's part of it, sure. Witchcraft, all that, baby steps. But I want to go further, as far away as possible, to a place where my pain makes me queen, empress, to a place where my pain makes me, what, fucking God? Good luck with that, man. She wouldn't look away, which meant I had to eventually, asking her after a beat. Besides, what about me? Well, you too, Una. Come on. Did you really think I didn't mean it like that? We're sisters now. Of course. You too. So long as you're willing to pay the same price, that is. She didn't say. And didn't have to. And that's it. Yeah. Right. Great. Like yeah. that. Like that. Love it. <laughs> okay. Um, our next reader is Elizabeth Hand. Right? Did I get that alphabetically right now? I think so. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth Hand is the author of 16 multiple award winning novels and collections of short fiction, including Curious Toys, Wilding Hall, Generation Lost, and the Book of Lamps and Banners. Her fourth noir featuring punk provocateur and photographer Cass Neary. Her standalone thriller, Under the Big Black Sun, will be out in 2022. Under non pandemic conditions, she divides her time between the Maine coast and North London. Please welcome Elizabeth Hand. Thank you. I'm going to read from For Sale by Owner. Uh, this is an excerpt, so it's about halfway through. And all you really need to know is the three main characters are three women in their 60s who like to wander the back roads of their small main town. And any unoccupied houses, uh, if the doors are unlocked, they open the doors and they go inside and they explore them. So they've come across a, a farmhouse on the back road. Every farmhouse I've ever been in was sprawling and slightly ramshackled and comfortably messy. Low beamed ceilings, wood floors scuffed and uneven, walls dinged up where kids had kicked them and showing evidence of having been painted and wallpapered numerous times over the years. The, the rooms opened onto one another and tended to be small with few windows. And once they could afford it, farmers usually adopted new technology, electricity, milking machines, anything that would make their lives easier. Electric lights and outlets would have marred the clean lines and planes of this house. I've been in plenty of old houses that have been up-to-dated, as the old timers put it, and ruined in the process. Not this one. The bedrooms seem to be almost perfectly square. Even the upstairs hallway felt square, though of course that was impossible. This symmetry could have felt restrictive and even claustrophobic. Instead, the plain white walls and warm toned floors and carefully ordered doorways made me feel not calm exactly, but quietly exhilarated. Like back when my husband Brandon and I would go to see a movie in the theater and we knew beforehand it would be good and make us forget about everything else for a few hours. The house made me feel something like that. You know what else is weird? Asked Rose, the way it smells. It smells fine. Helen glanced at me. I don't smell any mildew, do you, Marianne? No, I said, but she's right. That's what's weird. It doesn't smell like mildew or mice or anything like that. And it doesn't smell like paint either or polyurethane on the floors. We took a final circuit of the three rooms and then trumped downstairs. Rose walked over to the fireplace. You know what she sh we should do, she asked and looked at us expectantly. 
we should have a sleepover here. I said, I'm in. Helen hesitated. Someone would see us. People are still hiking up here. They're not hiking at night, said Rose. No one would see us, I said. If we just have flashlights, no one's going to notice. Helen mulled this over. It's going to be cold. It's cold in the state park lean-tos when we camp there in the fall, but there we can have a fire. Don't be a wuss, said Rose. We can tell the boys we're having a girls' night out in one of the lean-tos. If there's an emergency or something, they'll call us and we can head home. It'll be fun, I said, and looked out the window behind us. It'll be an adventure. I've always wanted to do something like this. Breaking and entering, Helen frowned. The door was unlocked, said Rose. Technically, it would be civil trespassing. Criminal trespassing means you broke in. If we come back here and it's locked, then we'll just turn around and go home. Even if we did get caught, it's only around a $100 fine. Helen looked at her in disbelief. How do you know so much about this? I told you I've always wanted to do it. Didn't you ever think about it when you were a kid? Yes, Helen said, but we're all 60 years old. That's why it's so important we do it now, said Rose. I'll bring wine, said Helen, and we all cheered. Me too, said Rose, and they walked to the front door. I stared at the empty room, its white walls graying as twilight fell, the glowing floorboards now charcoal. It still looked beautiful, and my exhilaration became a quiet sort of expectancy. I rested my hand against the wall again, saying goodbye, and followed the others outside. So they go back the following weekend for their sleepover. I'd arranged to pick up Rose and then Helen so we'd only have one car. It's going to be cold. I eyed Rose's sleeping bag, one of those flannel lined camp bags that's really just meant to be used indoors. I'm wearing, wearing layers, plus hot flashes. Did you bring the wine? I asked Helen when we picked her up. Of course. We drove through town, everything quiet as always, and dark, except for the sleep street light by the general store. I don't see well in the dark anymore, so I should have let Helen drive. She has better night vision. I steered carefully between potholes and ruts, keeping an eye out for deer, but it still took us twice as long to reach the end of the road as it had the last time. So they go into the house. We're home, Rose sang out as Helen and I walked in behind her. I hesitated and then closed the door. Immediately, I felt better, safer, even though the three of us were alone in a dark, empty house and trespassing at that. Hang on, said Helen, and I heard her rummaging in her backpack. Seconds later, light filled the room and she held up a large brass hurricane lantern. She crossed to the fireplace and set it on the mantel. Let there be light. We set down our sleeping bags, pillows, and other gear in the corner of the room. It felt distinctly warmer in here, or at least less cold. I took out my own lantern and Rose did the same with the lamp she'd brought. I unrolled my sleeping bag and dug through my backpack for the food that I bought at the general store. Rose had scooted over to the fireplace and was fiddling with something there. A match flared in her hand and she began to light a number of small votive candles. There, she said, and got to her feet. Now we can actually see I was surprised at what a difference those candles made. Combined with the lanterns on the mantel, they lit up the entire room. Everyone warm enough? asked Helen. I brought an extra hoodie and a big scarf. Rose nodded. I pointed at her cap. That was a good idea. So they eat their meals and afterwards, they started reminiscing about camping trips, snowstorms and power outages. This is so much better, Rose exclaimed. I'd do this all the time if I could. Really? Helen took a sip of her wine. I mean, you couldn't. You can't just go on breaking into houses. But don't you like being outside, seeing the stars and a campfire and the trees and everything? Rose wrapped her arms around her near knees and stared up at the ceiling. No, she said after a long moment. I like this. I prefer this. But we live indoors all the time, countered Helen. This isn't camping, really. I know that, but this is different. It's so welcoming. Helen and I looked at each other, but didn't say anything. I couldn't think of any reason why Rose would find this empty house more welcoming than her own one, which is a perfectly nice house, especially since Hank redid the kitchen a few years ago. But she did have a point. 
there was a kind of, maybe you could call it an aura about this place. It might have been what people mean when they talk about good feng shui. I'd never felt it before either, but I wouldn't say I preferred it to my own home. Maybe I could talk Hank into selling our place and buying it, Rose went on. I couldn't tell from her tone whether she was kidding or not. Well, that would make for an interesting conversation, said Helen, and we all laughed. When the chips were gone, Helen poured the last of the wine into our cups and placed the bottle on its side on the floor. Spin the bottle? She sent it rolling toward Rose, who put it in the bag we designated for trash and then turned to dig into her own backpack. It's only half full, she said, but here. She held up another wine bottle and refilled our, our cups. I felt pleasantly buzzed, not drunk, but happy. The light from the votive candles made the walls appear washed in yellow paint and cast all shimmering circles on the ceiling. I wondered what it would be like to live here, not seriously, not for myself, but for, for whoever had lived here once upon a time. So I'll stop there. Yeah. Thank you. So I, think, I think we'll take a five minute break now, if that's okay. Um, it's around 7.50, so you know, just five minutes and come on back. Everybody, we'll have a drink or something. Yeah, sounds good. You know, Liz, that's such a cool idea for a story. I absolutely oh, it's based on, Thank you. It's based on real life. Uh -huh. Wow. Okay. Some, of it, some of it. Yeah. I want to hear more about that because that, that is that is super cool. only only the legal parts, right? <laughs> ah, so is mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, that can come up in a Q and A afterwards. People. Can start <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> All right, I'll be right back. All right. Pound <laughs> a half fifth. Boom, boom. So girls, so many girls. <laughs>
Hello. So we should all go on a sleep out. Everyone wants to go on a sleep out. I used to have a sleeping bag. I don't know if I have one now. I had to buy a school when my uh, kid went camping. I used to go camping. And I don't think, the only way I'd go camping now is with an air mattress and in comfort <laughs> and in a van or something. You know? Me too. <laughs> Those are some great, I really, I really enjoyed Elizabeth's not back, but I really enjoyed that and I love Gemma. Oh, so. thank you. Thank you very much. I really, really am interested in actually everything that I've heard so far. Good. Well done, Elizabeth. It's awesome. Okay. John is not back and Sean is not back. Oh, and neither is Josh. It's Josh. We could start though without them. Without I am them. here. Oh, okay. Hi there. Cool. Hello. <clears throat> oh, an air mattress. Yes, an air mattress. Only way I'd do it. Okay. We don't need Josh or John <laughs> right now. Neither of them are reading right now. Next reader up is Stephen Graham Jones, who is the author of 25 or so novels and collections, and there's some novellas and comic books in there as well. Most recent are The Only Good Indians and Night of the Mannequins and My Heart with a Chainsaw. Stephen lives and teaches in Boulder, Colorado. Please welcome Stephen Graham Jones. Hello. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for help making this happen, Ellen and Matt. Um, I'm going to read from my story, Refinery Road. And, you know, the story comes from, um, man, I'm 15 years old. I am at my house in West Texas, way out in the country. And I had just rented Dirty Dancing. I'd never seen Dirty Dancing. And something about the um, title was kind of alluring. So I brought it home from the little gas station that was about 10 miles down the road. And I was about 20 minutes into it when I got a phone call. And the phone call was from one of my friends. And he was calling me from somebody who lived across the pasture from him. And what had happened was, well, I guess to back up, back then we all had old trucks. We were 15. We all had these old, like, you know, $400 trucks with two or 300,000 miles in the transmission. And so the transmission slips a lot when it gets that old. But we'd found that if you put one drop of brake fluid in the transmission, that would make some of the rubber seals in there swell up a little bit and it would shift better. And so I'd done it on my truck and it had worked. It was shifting better. And my friend tried it on his truck and it didn't shift better. So he put two drops and then 10 drops and then you know half a, half a quart. And sure enough, he spun his transmission out. And so the reason he was calling me was that his dad had figured out that he'd spun his transmission out. And so he chased my friend up into the pasture with his welding truck and he was trying to run him over. And so my friend called me, he said, you gotta come get me. You know, he's, my dad's gonna kill me. So I went and got him. And um, the I never got to finish Dirty Dancing. I never saw Dirty Dancing for probably 20, 25 years after that, I bet. And my friend, he ended up, um, as these things go, I guess, he. He got um, he got considered the problem in the family instead of his dad, and so he got thrown in an institution. And I remember he would call me for months after that, after that, because back then in payphone land, there was a number that um, police officers could dial from any phone, which would get them past the twenty-five cent requirement. And he had somehow figured that number out, and so he was always calling me from the payphone and just talking and talking. That's why I remember him. But um, lost track of him. I think the institution probably did what institutions do and turned him into a criminal, which is terrible. And, but this story, Refinery Road, I was able to go looking for him again. I'll read the first of it. Years later, at a trivia game in the bar of the hotel, Jensen's company had him, had him at for three days. An officer and a gentleman would roll up on every screen. The title and the poster both. The movie was the answer to whatever the obscure question had been. Jensen hadn't really been interested, was just riding out the cheers and groans, trying to finish his drink without getting jostled too much. The room and meals and cab fares were all expensed, but this drink, all nine dollars of it, was his and his alone. He left it sitting there, along with two singles for the bartender. 
it wasn't because he could have won that round if he'd been quicker on the draw. Even if he'd been tuned in, he wouldn't have called that movie out. He'd never even finished it. According to the screen, still assaulting him from all sides, it was from 1982, Richard Gere and Deborah Winger. But when Jensen, 17 then, had pushed it into his family's VCR in 1988, he didn't know Gere or Winger by name, by face, any of that. He just knew he'd like Top Gun enough his sophomore year. And according to the back of the box, this was another fighter pilot thing. and had been on 99 cent rental at the grocery store, so why not? Jen Jensen was just getting into the movie when Kara called him. The whole time she was telling him where she was, he was staring at an officer and a gentleman paused on screen, the video barely holding on, the tracking lines and static juddering his drill sergeant scene. It was bad for the tape, but Jensen left it paused like that all the same. Why Kara needed Jensen to pick her up now, now, now was that when she'd come home with a tattoo of her dead little brother's name on the inside of her left wrist so she could touch it with the fingertips of her right hand, her dad had lost it, called her every name he had coiled up inside. And when Kara finally ran out the front door, he'd fired his welding truck up, chased her through all the empty lots on their block, trying to run her down. He only stopped when she stumbled across the railroad tracks and his truck was too long, high centered on the rails, both the front and back tires spinning in the air. When Jensen picked her up at the gas station, Kara huddled in, just told him, drive, drive. She didn't want to be here anymore. Her lip was busted. Jensen offered her a tissue from the little pack his mom kept in the center console. He wasn't supposed to take the Buick out without explicit permission, but this was an emergency. He was already making the argument in his head, but if he got ragged on for taking it, so what? This was Kara, his best friend. She'd been there for him on the playground in fourth grade when he wet his pants. And she'd held his hand once at the mall to try to make a girl Jensen liked jealous. When her little brother had overdosed in his bedroom last year, Jensen had held her head to his shoulder for all of one afternoon and let her hit the side of her fists into his chest and shoulders every few minutes when it all rose for her again. They picked Moat up once Kara was calm enough. His parents had declared, decorated the front of their house for Halloween. And the reason Jensen turned the headlights off while Moat was locking his front door was that dad's being Halloween decoration cool like that wasn't what Kara needed to see right then. Moat slipped into the back seat like ducking out of a bank he just robbed, and that wasn't all wrong. He had a six of his dad's beer. Where to, Jensen asked all around. Just go, Kara told him. And so they do. They go off into places that are hard to come back from. Thank you. That's Refinery Road. Thank you, Stephen. And our next reader, unless I have the alphabet wrong, is Cassandra Kaw, I believe, <laughs> and was an award-winning game writer and former script writer at Ubisoft Montreal. Her work can be found in places like the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, Lightspeed, and Tour.com. Her first original novella, Hammers on Bone, was a finalist for the British Fantasy Award and the Locus Award. And her forthcoming novella, Nothing But Black and Teeth, will be published by Nightfire this month, very soon, I believe. So Next month. Go. We're still in September. Well, well, when I wrote this, it was September. It said September. I mean, so oh, that's people, true. That's true. You know, <laughs> hey, all been changing. I said as soon as the book comes out, everyone's bios are out of date. <laughs> this know? is very true. They were welcome that's really true. true. <laughs> Hello. Um, I am reading you the first part of my story, Quiet Dead Things. It began with a murder in the late summer which is to say started with a natural repudiation of the act. When news came forward of what had transpired, the woman tidily flayed and bolted to a tree in the adjacent village. The village of Abestas woke with rage. How dare their neighbors? Rural living was already besieged by sneering gossip of how cousins were married their way into monstrosity, allegations of non-consensual coital relations with the livestock. Claims that parishioners lacked both education and adequate hygiene routines, had bad politics and worse music, and nothing like common civility. It, it did not need this. To add homicide to their dossier of purported sins, it was unthinkable. Like Abestos, the tempestuous Cedarville was incense. Mr. Carpenter, who, despite his family name, 
had no facility with timber, but made up for such inadequacies, at least in his own head, by having more than a passing gift for people. Sent out little personalized letters to each of his constituents. What happened in the village wasn't just shocking; it was disgusting too. A reminder of how flimsy civilization was. <coughs> A veneer under which still rutted and writhed all kinds of paleolithic barbarisms. To be human, Mr. Carpenter believed, was to work relentlessly from dawn to deep dusk, perpetually vigilant against the shadow self. If any of you hear of such repugnance, wrote Mr. Carpenter, please make use of official council channels to inform us of what you've discovered. Your anonymity, of course, will be preserved. The channels in question were, in actuality, a small bird box installed outside the local arboretum, much too small to fit every one of the township's missives. But luckily, only a handful of the population was properly civic-minded. Over the years, it had been a square of farmland, a community garden, a greenhouse, a short-lived manor torched to its bones by the young daughter of the last family to inhabit its walls. Several pubs, a graveyard for the pets of the township's rich, and prior to the inauguration of the arboretum, a corner store operated by an immigrant pair. Cedarville had especially fond memories of the last. Mister Wong and his late sister were, although no one would admit such feelings in sober company, novelties. Up until this arrival. Cedarville was comprised entirely of Irish, French, Russian, Swedish, and German immigrants, all of whom produced children who then enjoyed romances with one another, creating a population who were, to a man, a heavily diluted salmon in color. See that much melanin and the refugee gods the Wongs brought with them, wages of a superstitious life unburdened by Christ, was invigorating. It was a reminder there was a world outside the fishbowl of Cedarville, lives outside the schedules of almanacs and shipping routes, places to go and things to do that did not require going home, and were far, far from even the scrutiny of the things that lived on Mister Richardson's farm. Exotic, the township of Cedarville understood, was a description when applied, a gracious. Description when applied to another human being, but they all thought it. Mister Wong and his sibling were very exotic. No one else in the township kept a shrine in memory of a deceased re relative. At most, the local Catholics lit votives while murmuring sheepish orisons, aware the baptized dead had absconded to a better place. Mister Wong. His round face ablated into a massive of grief, jowls and haggard cheeks hanging low as his spirits. Brought his late sister, six years younger than him, and only sixty-two when she died. Food too, soft white buns, spice cakes, austere bowls of sour vegetables, white rice, ladders of fatty pork belly, and incense. Always those joysticks to be lit with a morbid repast. The people of Cedarville knew to anticipate Mister Wong by the smoky odor of camphor, which clung to him like a malaise of the spirit. Not that anyone saw him with any regularity anymore. Loss had converted Mister Wong into a hermit, and regressed his life to native pleasures, ethnic cooking, calligraphy, foreign movies. The allegra the postwoman said, which cost a fortune to import. He avoided his neighbors. Lived frugally on the profits from the sale of his store, reserved his chatter for the altar over which a monochrome portrait of a teenage Miss Wong, nineteen, with an enormous bouffant and makeup far too old for her gravely cherubic face, presided. I think they were lovers," came an anonymous note, printed on periwinkle cardboard and neatly sleeved in a long cream envelope. Were it not for the daub of rose perfume, a wet storm-tossed summer scent, Mrs. Gagnon might have kept her identity secret. 
But like so many others in Cedarville, she was an animal of habit. That's why they never married anyone else. Fifty years of living here, and neither of them could find a spouse. They must have been fornicating. The use of the word fornicating was a very Mrs. Gagnon thing, Mr. Carpenter noted. As were her lavender fascinators with their taxidermed nightingales, as was her insistence. The Old Testament provided better instruction than its successor, and the way she took sacrament, like a harlot traversing her wedding night, with gusto, without hesitation, with the pleasure of years of practice. Mr. Carpenter and Mrs. Gagnon were not friends, but Mr. Carpenter trusted in her instincts and carefully inventoried her indictment of Mr. Wong. If nothing else. It was proof that Cedarville had at least become accustomed to Mrs. Gagnon, because for years it was Mrs. Gagnon who was hounded by the gossips. She had come to Cedarville like a portent, thrice divorced, a pageant alumni, richer than was courteous, a woman to be envied and thus one to resent. Now, she was a part of the body of Cedarville, holy by the church. Distrustful as any native of foreign intrusion, Mister Carpenter made a note to relay his congratulations. It was nice to see Missus Gagnon finally accepted among her peers. He liked it when good things happen to deserving people. Deserving being the operative word here. Mister Carpenter, though he understood such ideology was unpopular, even untenable in the current epoch, believed virtue was a currency. Kindness should not be extended to those who did not provide equal payment. Love, divine or otherwise, was a privilege to be earned. And that was the problem with the world these days: people expected too much for too little. And the avarice, Mister Carpenter believed, was the reason they all found one day nailed to a tree, throat and temples and trunk woven with a stigmata of thorns. The days yielded to weeks. Summer followed the autumn, and Mr. Smith's dogs grew restive in their kennels, eager to be done with the heat and set loose on their annual hunt. Traders came and went. The township fattened with imports. Cedarville was beginning to have, beginning to forget what had occurred in that little village to the west, when a man from Ambestos arrived. And this is where I leave everyone and try to see if the cats are trying to jump on me. Very much a Shirley Jackson esque story. <laughs> Thank you. So you're gonna feed your cat now, <laughs> or, or pet it? I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and see where they are because they're very large and they were just hovering next to me. With this look of like I would jump on you and claw you. They're going to eat you one night. <laughs> they really are. <laughs> That's why the Maine Coon people encourage other people to get Maine Coons. It's a collective, and only one Maine Coon owner is eaten each night. So as long as we make sure there are more of us, our own chances <laughs> go down. In this demonic cat death lottery. Now I know. Curse you. <laughs> okay. Our next reader is John Langan, who is the author of two novels and four collections of stories. For his work, he has received the Bram Stoker and This Is Horror Awards. He is one of the founders of the Shirley Jackson Awards and continues to serve on its board of directors. He lives in New York's Mid Hudson Valley with his wife, younger son, and certainly not too many books. Please welcome John Langan. This is called、uh, something like living creatures. Jenna sat cross-legged at the top of the ladder, where it was nailed to the loft. Either of the beds at her back would have raised her another two feet into the air, but she didn't think the extra height would make much, if any, difference. Besides, she liked the spot here. Where the ladder connected the house's two levels, at the gap in the railing which ran the length of the loft, it allowed her to survey the house's living room, dining area, and kitchen. The only parts of it not visible to her were under the loft: the bathroom, 
on the far side of the front door, and her parents' room, directly beneath her, behind a heavy yellow curtain. Her position allowed her a view out the large window set high in the wall opposite the loft. Through its expanse of panes, she could see the crowns of the trees staggered down the hill below the house, and beyond them, the broad Penobscot River, its surface flat gray under the overcast sky. A line of fog hid the far shore. Faintly, Jenna could hear the foghorn droning. She wasn't certain of its location. Mother and father liked the sound. Like so much in this part of Maine, it reminded them of the old country. From where she was sitting, near the foot of the ladder, leafing through her Catholic Bible, Samantha said, Do you see anything? Not yet, Jenna said. She isn't trying, Kayla said. She was seated at the kitchen table, her back to the scene at the kitchen window, her attention focused on the deck of playing cards whose individual number she continued to turn over in front of her. She had wrapped one of the bath towels around her hair because she said it made her look like a psychic. Jenna thought it made her look as if she had just come out of the shower. She said, I am trying, though she wasn't not the way she did when she truly wanted to look for. This Bible talks about creatures with four faces, Samantha said. Actually, it says they were something like living creatures. How is something like a living creature? I don't know, Jenna said. Beats me, Caleb. That's why I prefer to stick to Virgil. Plus, you know, tradition. You and Virgil, Jenna said. It says the creatures had face of a human being in the front, the face of a lion on the right side, the face of an ox on the left side, and then it says they had the face of an eagle, but it doesn't say where. It would have to be on back, right? Makes sense, Jenna said. If you say so, Kayla said. From the nearer edge of the curtain across mother and father's room, a finger of buttery light stretched across the living room floor, fading as it approached the opposite wall. Samantha was turning the onion skin pages of her Bible, Bible on the oval rug to the left of the light. Jenna wished she wasn't so close to the reaching light. Not that anyone's asking, Kayla said, but the cards are talking. What are they telling you? Samantha said. The hearts are gathering, Kayla's. The four kings are in alignment. Hearts mean family, right? Samantha said. And kings mean power, Jenna said. Yes, Kayla said. But. Samantha snickered. You said but. Shut up, Jenna said. It isn't that kind of but. I know, Samantha said. The ace of spades keeps showing up mixed in with the hearts, Kayla said. He means violence, doesn't he? Samantha said. It's a card, Kayla said, not a he. But yes, it does mean violence. Bad violence, Jenna said. Is there any other kind of violence? Kayla said. I mean, Jenna said, violence so bad it tears everything apart, throws everything down, like an earthquake or a hurricane. Or one of the living creatures, Samantha said. I think they have four wings, too. Did I mention that? No, oh, Jenna said. Do you see anything, Kayla said. Not yet, Jenna said. She isn't trying, Samantha said. Shut up, Jenna said. I am trying. The finger of light on the floor dimmed as if something was occluding it. This Bible says if you cook a fish's heart, it will drive away devils. How did they find that out, Kayla said. Did they experiment? Let's try a bird's heart. Anything? No? Okay, what's next? I know, a fish. It says the fish was a monster, Samantha said. Well, monsters. Which just means it was big, Kayla said. Not necessarily, Jenna said, although she thought it was probably right. 
So will any fish's heart work, Samantha said, or does it have to be a monfish? Monstrous, Kayla said. You can also use his gallbladder to cure blindness, Samantha said. That's some fish, Kayla said. I wonder what its small intestine does. How about its spleen, its left eyeball? This Bible mentions Asmodeus, Samantha said. Hush, Jenna said. Which was he, Kayla said. You know, Jenna said. He's the limping one, Samantha said. He has chicken foot. Jenna couldn't help herself. Rooster. Right, Kayla said. His domain is lust. Okay, Jenna said. Lust, Samantha said, and giggled. I'm going to try to see now, Jenna said. I thought you were trying, Kayla said. You said you were, Samantha said. I'm going to try harder, Jenna said. Whatever you say, Kayla said. The finger of light on the bare wolf brightened, as if whatever was in its way had moved. There's the piece of spades again, Kayla said. And that's where I'll leave it. Thanks very much. But yes, I think the the shortest story that John has ever written, probably right. And Is the shortest about... story in the book, right? Yes, definitely for sure. So he said he can't read the whole thing. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. And our last reader tonight is uh, Josh Mallerman. He's a New York Times bestselling author of Bird Box, Mallory, and Unbury Carol. He's also one of two singer-songwriters for the Detroit band The High Strung, whose song The Luck You Got can be heard as a theme song to the Showtime series Shameless. He lives in Michigan with the artist musician Allison Lacko. Is that pronounced right? Lacko. Lacko. Please welcome Josh Mallerman. Thank you. Thank you, Allen. This is Special Meal. It was that time of year again when I had to pretend I didn't know math. We were at the dinner table, me on my side, my elbows barely reaching the wood. Brad across from me with his silly spiky hair. Dad was to my left and mom to my right. But I don't like talking about rights and lefts because directions scare me. They're a little too much like math. How many of us were here? I don't want to say. We were eating chicken Kiev, my favorite, because the butter squirted out of the bird and it made me laugh and I loved the taste. And because mom said, Amy, I've never met someone who loves something like you love chicken Kiev. That's nice, isn't it? The smallest compliment, but let's not talk amounts. Let's talk family and dinner and the television on in the living room where Buckle Up was playing silently. Dad having put the record on the machine, the one with all the strings and swells and slow moves. The TV, the light of the TV was all over mom, painting her blue, as there was no wall between the kitchen and the living room, that being my favorite place in the house, the exact spot where a wall might have been but wasn't. Brad didn't like chicken kia, but Brad was late to everything. Dad once said, and mom said, is it okay to know what late means? I remember that discussion. They didn't think I heard them, but in a house as small as ours, you hear. Mom was worried dad had used math. Late, she said, implies time passing. I remember that. Dad said it was okay to know time. Mom said it wasn't though. It was harder for them to pretend they didn't know math because they grew up with it. And green beans, Dad said, putting some on my plate. I loved green beans almost as much as I loved chicken Kiev. It was like a birthday dinner, but of course I couldn't be sure when my birthday was. We ate quiet for a while. Brad didn't speak much anyway. I think it's because his friend Melanie got in trouble. I would be quiet too if I kept remembering the time my friend told me she knew math. What was Brad supposed to do with that secret? He did what he was supposed to do. He turned Melanie in. We need more milk, Mom said. That was often how our conversations began, little things, what we needed, what we didn't, what we'd use. All right, Dad said, and other things. All right, Dad said. He 
Yes, half of Mana's face was painted blue by the television. I remember worrying about that word, half. I was so busy stuffing my face, I hadn't noticed the mood was off. Brad wouldn't look me in the eye, which was okay, which was normal. But Mom and Dad, there was something there too. The way they kept looking across the table, asking if I was okay, asking if I wanted more, then going quiet again. They didn't even get up, get up to flip the album when it came to a stop. One of them usually said, want to play the other side? Because who would be caught saying they knew which side was which? Uh, the car sounds funny, Mom said. She knew all these things, what we needed, what sounded funny. And there was always hesitation before every time she spoke, when she considered what she was going to say. I overheard Dad tell her once she was thinking too much about it. When they said we couldn't know math, they didn't mean we couldn't know when it was midday. Mom shushed him when he said that. But Dad continued, saying there was math in everything, literally everything. And people couldn't be expected to not know that a couple made two. Well, Mom freaked out when he said that. She hurried Brad and me into the basement, locked the basement door, waited. While we were down there, she talked about colors. She sat on a stool under the light bulb and talked about moods and feelings and colors, all stuff that Dad would say would call safely vague. But Dad was upstairs then, and Mom was waiting to hear sirens, I think, waiting for someone to come ask Dad what he knew about a couple being equal to two. He was angry up there, pacing. Dad didn't yell. He wasn't a yeller, but you knew when he was upset. He couldn't sit still. He talked to himself, but really, he was talking to Mom. Knowing we could hear him down below, Brad hadn't done what he was supposed to do with Melody at that point, so he was talkative still, talked with Mom about colors. But I listened to Dad. I heard him say it's in everything, age, time, space, outer space, nature, work, rest, everything, except feelings, Mom said. Her head cocked to the ceiling, and we knew she was talking to Dad, whether or not Dad could hear her. That night was bad, but nobody came to ask Dad what he meant by two. More beans, I said. I couldn't get enough of them. The chicken, the beans, and the bread rolls, oh my. Mom worried I ate too much, but Dad said it was fine. It was good. It was nice to see. Oh, wait, Dad said, getting up from the table. He went to the refrigerator and came back with a pitcher of grape juice. Oh, Mom said, I almost forgot. Amy, Dad said, your favorite. Is it my birthday, I asked. Brad looked up then, only for a moment. Mom and Dad exchanged a look, and then Mom smiled my way, and it looked like her face might crack in half. That word again, half. That's math. It's in everything. Do you really not know what today is, Dad asked? It's okay if you don't. No, I said. Stop being silly. Amy, honey, Mom said. Tonight's your test. I set my fork down. Oh, had it been a year? What was a year, anyway? Well, we received a few, she considered how to put it. We received a letter recently. Remember I told you about it? Dad looked like he was going to cry. Oh, yeah, I said. I picked up my fork and started eating. It was so good, I thought I could eat that dinner forever. When are they coming? Well, Dad said, pointing the grape juice. We don't know that kind of thing. Not exactly. Right. Brad's fork scraped the plate. It sounded bad. Tonight, Mom said. That smile again. Dad sat down. So he said, Amy, you know, we got to ask you a question before they come by, right? Yes. And you know what that question is, right, Mom asked? Yes. You need to ask me if I know math. Silence, not because I'd said something shocking. I was right. This was the question, but because now that I'd said it, it had kind of been asked, and they were waiting for the answer, even Brad. How could they not know if I knew math, right? Well, I think it has to do with kids being young and getting into things and who knows what they do all the time and what they think and what they pick up, too, maybe even what they teach themselves. That's what I do. I learned math on my own. It wasn't from a book. It was from listening closely to mom and dad. They used numbers all the time, even when they didn't mean to. Dad was right. Of course, there was math in everything. And if you kept quiet and listened, you could hear it. Math. Want an example? One night, in mom and dad's bedroom, a storm outside, Brad and I were in bed with them, and Brad asked if we could stay that way forever, if we could stay in their room and make jokes and watch television. Dad said, no, Brad. One day, you won't need us. One day, you'll be on your own two feet. You catch that? Of course you did. One day, two feet. Brad had two feet. I suppose that meant I did too. Mom didn't catch that one. She didn't catch a lot. Like when I asked if we could get a dog and mom said, can you imagine a four-legger in this tiny house? Four. 
the numbers came to me like this over time and I was open to them. I learned two, four, seven, three, nine, one, eight, five, six, in that order, I think. I don't know for sure if there is an order. I think there is, because I know we have eight shoes, two each, see? That's math. Mom used to smile and ruffle my hair and tell me I was cute the way I liked to play with all her shoes, but I was adding, I was subtracting. I was learning there on the carpet. I wondered how Melanie learned her math. I wondered what she looked like when she told Brad she did. No, I told them. I don't know math. A lie, of course, but I don't, I didn't want them to have to do what they were supposed to do. And not just because I didn't want to be taken away. I didn't want mom and dad to become quiet like Brad became quiet because of doing what he was supposed to do with Melanie. So no math. That's good, dad said. But they exchanged another glance and I, I knew they knew. Is there dessert, I asked. Of course, dad said. Are you done with that chicken? No, not at all. I just wanted to know. Amy, honey, mom said, can I ask you another question? Yeah. How many forks are you holding? Yes, they knew. I don't know, Mom. My fork. Brad was staring at me now. Mom and Dad couldn't stop at the worried glances across the best dinner of my life. Amy, Dad said, how many fingers am I holding up? He held up three. Don't do that, Mom said. Come on, Dad said. Please, Mom said. Use a different example. Terrible silence. And the kind when you knew Dad felt really bad inside. How many windows are in your room, Amy, Dad said. Just stop it, Mom said. She got up and went to the refrigerator, opened the door. Dad eyed me, sadness all over his face, worry. He looked like he still wanted an answer. The answer was one. It's just the window, I said. I don't know. I'll stop there for now. Wait, with, uh, with an A minor. That really worked. That really worked the, the guitar. Wow. That's really cool, the tension it brings up. Sweet. Wow. Thanks. Okay. So we are going to have questions now. If anyone has questions, you can have questions for yourselves, for each other too, if you want. What are you doing, Stephen? <laughs> is Michael? Is that Michael Myers? I'm really bad on the. Um, <laughs> on the <laughs> oh. We have a masked man here. <laughs> so I know it takes a while for um, questions. You know, there's a lag between what people do on YouTube and here, so. Um, so it may take a while for questions to show up. So if anyone wants to ask, yeah, go for it. Okay. I have a question. Am I going? Yeah, no. yeah, even sorry, yeah. Oh, it was, it was for John. John, you said Catholic Bible. I didn't realize. Do, do all like Christian denominations have a, their own Bible? <laughs> Is that how it works? Well, there's like a, a major a major separation between um, the the Catholic Bible, which includes the Apocrypha, um, so things like the Book of Tobit and that, and um, um, like the King James Bible, which uh, which doesn't. Um, so yeah, there, there are uh, and and you know there those other Bibles we're not supposed to really talk about. So oh, okay, <laughs> do they like do they like underline different things or what? Do, I mean, are there like big substantive differences? Oh, well, some I never of the, this, like so. some of the um, yeah, yeah, no, the, there's like the, 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 I think it's the Douay Reims Bible, um, the friend, which was produced in, in France is actually one of the most accurate, I guess, in terms of translations. Um, whereas King James takes a lot of liberties with, uh, you know, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live and that sort of stuff when it's basically, uh, it doesn't really say stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I think, you so, know, yeah, I think it, it's there, there are, um, no, I think um, it makes sense that King James isn't as accurate. I think LeBron spends most of his time playing basketball. No? <laughs> oh, my God. Was, it, was this all just a setup for that? Was this all just, I mean, come on, man. <laughs> what would Shirley Jackson say? I hear a background sound. This yeah, is, I like it. What is it? It's oh. like Anthony from the Twilight Zone. Oh, oh. Okay. Um, someone has, Matt, can you post that question that Greg Green asks? Can you see it, Matt? There it is. Laird, that's for you. Uh, yeah, it is, actually. Um, male, the father is a pivotal figure in both of them, but... You know, Alaska, I'm about as far away from Alaska as I can be and still be in the continental 
U.S. and um, the uh, viewpoint character uh, you know, as a male this time, but I just felt there was more I could do. It's not, they're not related in other ways, except maybe just that they exist in the same sort of continuity I uh, created, uh, but the monsters, but if there's a monster, is a different, a different stripe altogether. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Want, oh, sorry. I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to meet either of those monsters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyone have another question for one of the other people reading? Matt, do you have any questions? <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. <clears throat> uh, what's the nat ultimate Helen, nature? Matt hasn't reality. been paying attention to any of this. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. On Twitter. Anyway, to me, math is terrifying. I hate math. I mean, I I am terrible at math. I can add and multiply in my head, kind of, somewhat, but dividing, forget it. And anything beyond, you know, those four things, I can't do. I, hate, I always hated math. Yeah. Oh, okay. Here, um, Kevin has a question. Um. Is this for me? Oh, no, it's for the What's writers. Everyone? <clears throat> um, it's for the writers. I mean, well, let me let me say first that as the editor, I did not want people to really use any specific works of Jackson's. I, mean, I wanted no prestiges or anything like that. Um, but I did. I believe, if I remember from the guidelines, I did encourage them to use their tone and. Theme certainly. So, would you like any of you would like to respond to this? Raise your hand if you want to go first. <laughs> uh, Gemma. Okay. Um, if you can hear something in the background, that's my son listening to cartoon music for okay. some <laughs> insane reason. Okay. Um, so, basically, my for myself, uh, I I grabbed onto what I thought were thematic links um, and possibly sort of delivery system stuff. I mean, not, you know, <laughs> there, there's, there's no swearing in Shirley Jackson, but um, otherwise, you know, her stuff tends to be uh, about women. It tends to be about a sort of hermetic um, relationships and rituals. Um, her stuff tends to be about social anxiety um, and her stuff tends to be about uh, witchcraft or um, mimic witchcraft. So I thought, hey, I have an idea that fits most of those parameters and I did it. Um, but like I said, it was, uh, it was at least partially based on, on real life. Um, You'll have to figure out which part. So. Um, Cassandra had to drop off because uh, someone was making uh -oh. charges on, uh -oh. on their car. So oh dear! Oh, no. And Shannon had to leave earlier because her connection was. I think she she was outside and her battery was going dead. So that's why we had her first anyway. Um, John, you wait. I'm a little nervous I'm that both the cat people, uh, both the cat people are gone. I'm a cat person. I'm not gone. I'm one yeah. in this room. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Claire, did you want to respond to that question? Oh, yeah, just real quick, because Kevin um, had been in, in the comments had asked, uh, or was actually talking to Gemma about the witchcraft, and rightly, you know, and how she drew that out. I was happy to see it. I, I agree. Um, and not, not necessarily even with witchcraft, but just there's an occult <clears throat> thread through a lot of Jackson's work. And my, my thing is, even though uh, I, I took it to heart to not emulate Jackson too closely, but to try to capture more, you know, more just the overall feeling or preoccupations of her work. But I did, there, there are a couple of details uh, in there that I certainly seized upon. And one of them is there's a character you don't, you didn't meet in the excerpt, but uh, who's a medium or, or a self-professed medium. And that was something I, I felt was important to put in the story just because, um, or at least allude to, because it does seem to be integral to a lot of Jackson's um, 
uh, portfolio. And that's what I have. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to respond to that? Sure. Um, I was thinking more, yeah, mood. Um, because one thing that, I mean, she does a million things wonderfully well, we all know. Um, one thing that she does is the creeping dread without it being a slow burn, where where it's like, you know, in, in other hands, it might be like take a while to get there or whatever, but it seems to hit the ground running with the, in terms of that mood, mm -hmm. that bow, that tension. And so that's, I guess that would be the most influential thing for me there. I was like, okay, I want, I want to hit the ground with the mood right away and maintain it. It doesn't mean a lot has to happen right away. away. But let's let's try to keep something understated, but not a slow burn at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, even I wanted to write about a group of characters going to Shill House, but Ellen told me that was not going to happen at all. <laughs> 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 no, but um, <laughs> but um, really, um, in in Hill House, there's that wonderfully disturbing moment where um, Eleanor and um, is it Theodora or in a room and the door's locked and somebody's banging on the door and it turns out to have been, been Eleanor, you know? And um, that idea of either time travel or being in two places at the exact same time is to me just wonderfully disturbing. So I just kind of ported that right out and used it in my story. For no um, evil house, luckily. <laughs> <laughs> Liz, do you want to say anything about it? Uh, I guess I was sort of just going for some of the tone of Jackson and, and also some of her humor. She, you know, she's, she's funny in this low key way. And while I wasn't emulating any of her particular stories, I was thinking of um, her story, the summer people, which is set in Northern new England. And it's just sort of, you know, it's kind of funny and until it's not. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's also feels very much drawn from, from her actual, you know, life and experience up there in, in North Bennington. Mm -hmm. John, do you have anything to add to about your influence, what you tried to do? I was just trying to get a story into this anthology. <laughs> <laughs> and he was on time. He was short and on time. I was, I was short and game. early. Yeah. He did the right. minimal, Usually he's standard. long and late. <laughs> Um, all right, um, Greg has a, another question for Don. Is that so? <laughs> um, so so um, to, to be brief, I, I kind of, um, I, I sort of like cast, like I really wanted to, to engage with Jackson in some way, right? And um, um, and since Ellen had already told Stephen no Hill House, I was like, well, you know, she's not going to let Stephen do Hill House. She's not going to let me do Hill House, you know. <laughs> and um, so, so I was just thinking about um, like like Jackson's concern with um, like in in, um, in in the haunting of Hill House. You, you have those different, you know, Eleanor is is a you know some type of medium, some type of psychic, and then you've got Doctor Montague's wife who's talking about Planchette and what Planchette is showing her. And is this sort of figure of fun um, for for us as as readers? So I don't know. I, I thought it would be kind of interesting to have these different kinds of augury that were brought together, um, and to have these the, this and and also, you know, Jackson is so sharp in terms of people. Just you know, sort of they're they're talking. Um, the, the, all their words are barbed. You know, everything they're saying to one another is barbed, and and. Um, the um so so yeah i looked up different kinds of fortune telling and um like i thought like 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 things like tarot cards seemed like just a little too on the nose but mm -hmm. using a regular deck of cards seemed kind of interesting because how would you interpret that um and um uh and virgil is actually people did used to do that virgil uh editions of the aeneid were were used for a kind of fortune telling you you just popped it open you pointed at a line and then that line would give you something um, and so i thought that you know yeah and i thought that the um the catholic bible thing i thought well of course protestants suspect that all catholics are secret satanists so i thought <laughs> you know so so yeah you know um and the um so so yeah and and there is there is a connection um and um I can't really say anything more about the uh, the names or or some of the people I work with in my day job might uh, who actually know all about this might uh, 
uh, <laughs> might, you know, seek legal recourse. So, I, I have a question for Ellen. Are, are all the stories in the anthology supernatural? Oh gosh, I never thought about it. Uh, I have to. I'd have to think about each one. Um, uh, mine's not. Okay. Right. You know. Yeah. Yeah. No, Josh is definitely not. Um, let's see. I don't. Jim, is your yours isn't really supernatural, is it? Uh, mine might be. Mm -hmm. It's ambiguous. <laughs> it it kind of depends on what actually happened. Yeah, and actually, John, yours yours isn't supernatural. So no, so, right? I mean, do you agree, John? I can't really. I, I can't really <laughs> answer that that uh, that question. Do you, do you? What do you think, Alan? Do you think it's supernatural? Well, everybody here got really know. evasive. No, suddenly. I don't think so. Um, <laughs> I have to go back and remember each story. Um, Genevieve Valentine's isn't supernatural. So I mean, a lot of them are not. They're psychological more than, and some of them are psychological and supernatural. Um, so not, no, not all of them. You know, I mean, Jackson is a master of psychology. I mean, the lottery is not supernatural at all. You know. Yeah, I think some of her most terrifying stories are just about domestic horror. Right, uh, right. In the suburbs. Yeah, and yeah, domesticity, domesticity and dysfunctional families. And um, yeah, and um, did you see David? David Service has a question for Gemma. Um, yeah, uh, a little bit, maybe. I mean, I, I do think that Joyce Carol Oates is one of the most Jacksonian, uh, current writers. Mm -hmm. Um, and she's very interested in things that occur between the lines, even when, even when the story is delivered as this one is in a monologue. Um, you know, it's sort of like, well, what do you actually think happened? What What are you saying happened? Are you Are you talking around something? Um, and like I said, you know, I might be. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Joyce is in the book too, and I think I don't think her story is supernatural, from what I recall. No. No. I mean, again, it. It, it all comes down for me to the fact that it is actually based on on something that happened to me, which is that one day I came to school and uh, there was a crowd of people looking down into the ravine and uh, I came up to a kid at the back of the crowd and said, what are you all looking at? And um, he said, oh, there's, uh, someone said they saw a girl down there, uh, maybe dead. She was like naked and she, someone had cut her throat and they say Gemma Files did it. Wow. Whoa. Yes. What? Oh, wow. Which, uh, which tells you, tells you how much I was, I was liked at that school. Jeez. That's incredible. That's like, you're like a local legend while you're still like there going. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, that's, yeah, that's I was, unbelievable. I, I, I remember being really insulted, <laughs> being really and you know, like offended, but also like, why would you say that? Why would you say that about me? Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> man, that usually oh. takes like generations before like you know like Joe Tresk or something, and you're like, yeah, I'm right here. So was there a dead body there? No, of course it wasn't. And <laughs> did you do it? Uh, no. <laughs> no. No, That's amazing, Jenna. Wow. <laughs> Jenna, is is this at like ReaderCon a couple of years ago? I feel like we were talking about possible yes. follow-ups or, or like next novels after yes, experiment. That's right. Okay. That's right. And okay. um All right. I I am still moving I am still moving towards that and part of you know, part of writing Pair of Anguish was to essentially write a short story that could be written by one of the characters in that novel. So oh, there you go. Wow. Okay. That's very <laughs> exciting. Yeah. Much like, uh, much like Caitlin um, Kernan uh, folded in a bunch of her short stories into both uh, The Drowning Girl and The Red Tree. Mm -hmm. So. Jabula Gemma. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> but thank you, Kevin. Thank you. <laughs> yeah.
It was bad at the time. But, you know, you don't know what I did. <laughs> Something much worse, I'm sure. <laughs> Are we talking before or after? <laughs> well, you know, it's like... Or both. You, you, um, you, you know, it's like there's, there's reasons that you get a reputation, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Thank God you. she's safely in Canada. <laughs> That's it. Oh, what grade were you in when that happened? Oh, what grade was I in? Yeah. I was in um, grade five, I think. Five or six. Uh -huh. Yeah. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah, it was elementary school. It was, you know, just, just before I made the long ascent up into light. Mm -hmm. The long, hard ascent up from hell. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. Look at what David's saying. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yes. And you channel it all into your writing. <laughs> yes. He's up there that in is... Canada with her. He has to be careful. <laughs> <laughs> well, David knows all about the ravine. The, <laughs> the ravines of, of Toronto. Mm-hmm. As you will find out if you read his amazing book, Red X. I have is, it. I haven't read it yet. I have a pile of books next to me that I have to read. Uh, it mm -hmm. is spectacular. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, if no one else has questions, um, we can wrap it up if you like. <clears throat> I am so glad you all came and participated. <laughs> and that the book's coming out next week. It's like, yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll let you know when I get my copy and, you know, they have your, all well, your addresses. If anyone's moved lately, let me know. Cool. And thank you to the audience. Thank you everybody who showed up. Thank and you everyone. This will be living someplace on YouTube. Well, you know, when it's live or whatever you call it, when it's up there permanently, we'll give a link. And Alan, thank you for, for having me. Uh, for having us, for having I'm, me. I'm just, I'm relieved that, I mean, I'm glad that we actually, yeah. 10 people actually worked. I think that's a mi maximum. Well, I meant, I meant in the book, but here, it here. Oh, I, no, 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 I know. I, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, both. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, it was really great seeing everybody. And, it was wonderful uh, seeing you. It was wonderful seeing sometime. everybody. And hopefully, um, Gemma, yeah, maybe, and everyone. David, maybe I'll see you both in Montreal. Maybe, that hopefully. Yeah, okay. it's possible. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. All and please, things. everyone, thank Matt for holding this all together. Yes. Thanks, Matt. Matt. Thank Matt. Matt. Yay. Thank I owe you it, but, uh, Okay. Good night. Love you all. Good night. Good night. Thank you all. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night.